It's great to be with you uh, this evening and uh, to bring greetings again from your friends at Cornerstone Church uh, in Nottingham. I had the laziest trip up the M1 possible, really. It was sort of sunny, and if I hadn't had the sat-nav on, I'd have probably just carried on going further north. Um, it was sort of warm in the car. I was sleepy, but it's very good to be with you uh, this evening. When I retired uh, six years ago, I was given a fantastic card. It was a card with a crowd of retired people on the front and they were protesting. You can see part of the card there. And through a megaphone, the leader was shouting, what do we want? And with one voice, the pensioners responded, we can't remember. <laughs> and when do we want it? Yelled the leader. We're not sure, but it better be soon. We can't remember. We're not sure. Forgetfulness isn't just an issue for those who are older. It's something that God's people have often struggled with. You see, remembering is spiritually significant. Time and again, the prophets called on God's people to remember him, to remember him and his deliverance and his provision. In the Bible, remembering is hugely important. The Lord's Supper is given to help us remember and yet we so easily forget. 2,000 years ago, that first Palm Sunday, the crowd shouted, Hosanna! They waved palm branches as Jesus entered Jerusalem. But we now know that they didn't really understand what they were doing. And so this Palm Sunday evening, let's think forward five days. Let's think forward to Good Friday. We gather again at 10 o'clock Good Friday morning. That's a good thing to do. And to remember then the purchase of forgiveness and reconciliation. Do you see, Jesus entered Jerusalem knowing full well that that year he was to be the Passover lamb. That he was going to lay down his life for ours. In fact, that's why he came. God is holy. That's how we began with that wonderful uh, hymn. God is holy. And so our sin presents a problem. If we're going to get close to God, our sin has to be covered and forgiven. And Jesus came, came that we might have relationship with God so that when his father looks at us, he doesn't see our sin, but sees his son's perfection, sees his son's sacrificial death. Jesus, our Passover lamb, has indeed been sacrificed for us. And as we look into this psalm, Psalm 130, we'll see that we have redemption. Why? Because the Passover lamb died in our place, paying the price in full. This wonderful psalm reminds us where forgiveness is to be found and reminds us about the kind of forgiveness that we need. So I hope this evening, I hope Psalm 130 is going to help us see again the significance of that first Good Friday. The psalmist ached to be right with God. That was his need 3,000 years ago and that's our aching need today. The psalmist was then overwhelmed by God's goodness and love, overwhelmed by receiving the forgiveness that he needed, overwhelmed by having his relationship with the Lord restored. And once he'd re received forgiveness, he shouted out to those who would listen that what God had done for him, he would do for them. So this psalm, is about remembering where forgiveness is found. It points us forward to Good Friday, the day that forgiveness was won. Psalm 130 opens with the psalmist remembering. His situation is dire, but once he remembers, he cries out to the Lord for mercy and he receives forgiveness. And then having remembered, he calls on God's people to remember and to put their hope in him. 
as we'll see, Psalm 130 is full of important Bible words, full of vital truths, full of significant insights. It teaches us about the seriousness of sin. It teaches us about the wonderful reality of God's forgiveness. It reminds us where our hope love is. It reminds us about the Lord's unfailing love and redemption. We'll see that Psalm 130 ends in a very different place from where it began. It begins with the psalmist looking in on himself, in on his dire situation. And it moves on as in desperation he looks up to the Lord in prayer. And it ends with the psalmist looking out, looking out across the Lord's people as he points them to his Lord and theirs. It's a grand psalm, a grand psalm with a grand message. And it takes us from the very depths of despair to the wonderful heights of service for the Lord. It starts in absolute desolation. Verses 1 and 2. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my prayer. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. This is an intimate moment. We're looking in as the psalmist struggles. There he is in the depths of despondency. And the Lord hears his anguished cry and answers him. Our God listens out for our cries for mercy and forgiveness and in love and grace stoops down and responds. And the minute the psalmist prayer has been heard, anguish and despair give way to joy and gratitude. The psalmist knows he's redeemed, knows he's forgiven, and he goes on to encourage the Lord's people to look to him and to experience the same transformation. You'll know that it was John Newton who wrote the famous hymn, Amazing Grace. Newton was the captain of a slave ship, and he was once caught out on the high seas in a violent storm. And he prayed, and in his prayer, he promised God that if God would rescue him, he'd serve God for the rest of his life. Out of the depths, Newton called, and the Lord answered. He was saved. He repented. He taught himself to read the Bible in its original languages. And when the opportunity came, he left the dreadful slave trade, becoming a great friend of William Wilberforce, the anti-slavery campaigner. Interestingly, Newton was a very old man when he wrote Amazing Grace. The line that you remember, I once was blind, reminded him that in fact in his younger days, when his eyesight had been so good, he'd been spiritually blind. And you'll know that the hymn goes on, but now I see. Now elderly, and in fact virtually blind, John knew the Saviour, and so he had the clearest spiritual insight. And here, the psalmist is up to his neck in it. He realised that the Lord knew all about him and about his sinfulness. Verse 3. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Lord, you're holy and I'm sinful. Your holiness means I can't get close to you. My sin separates me from you, but I can't bear not being in your presence. The history of our world is one of greed and exploitation, abuse of power and abuse of people. It's a history of fear and selfishness. And you and I are parts of that history. We may not have murdered, but we've sniped at people and had a critical spirit. We may not have exploited others, but we've grumbled and been unkind. We may not have been sinister, but we've been self-centered. We've been unstraightforward, unloving and unfair. That's the depressing reality 
and the sin within the psalmist concerns him. He's looked inside and he's seen the uncleanness and the selfishness. And he knows that he can't get close to God's dazzling, brilliant, penetrating holiness like that. Who can stand before the Lord? None of us. Certainly, the psalmist knows that he can't. And he blushes with shame as he recognizes that his tainted and corrupted life is not good enough for God's holy presence. It's in another psalm, Psalm 14, that we're told, the Lord looks down from heaven to see if there are any who seek God. His desperately sad conclusion is that all have turned aside and become corrupt. There is no one who does good. You'll know, as well as me, that many people today don't think that sin matters. Others, th others think there's no such thing as sin, and many joke about it. But the psalmist knows his sin is something that can't just be shrugged off. Unlike John Newton, we've not been involved in slave trading, but we know our sin has hurt others and it's offended God. And so there's the psalmist in the depths of despair. Self-pity is useless. He needs outside help. Self-help is useless. He needs rescue. Time and again, the Bible tells us that because of our sin, we're under condemnation. And that's why the psalmist cries out for mercy. He's floundering. It's out of the depths that he appeals for rescue. And those deep waters are a picture of his guilt as he senses the weight of God's judgment. I can be too casual about my sin and fail to grasp its sinfulness. The psalmist felt the weight of his and was almost drowned by it. You see, we each have a fundamental need to be right with God. That's how we function as human people. And here the psalmist is on the verge of being overwhelmed. Actually, that's a good place to be, as long as we don't stop at verse 3. A good place to be, as long as we read on to verse 4. The evil one is well named, for that's exactly what he is. He spends half his time telling us our sin doesn't matter that it doesn't spoil things, that God is just a spoil sport. The evil one is rightly called the deceiver, wanting to trip us up, taking pleasure in our failures. And we so easily are taken in, thinking small, one-off sins don't really matter. And then the minute we've sinned, the deceiver becomes the accuser. For the evil one is both, both deceiver and accuser. You shouldn't have done that, he says. You've blown it now. God won't like that. And once we've done something wrong, we can think it's unfor unforgivable and that God will give up on us. Psalm 130 is telling us that sin is like being mired in a watery waste. The psalmist's problem is his sin. That's why he can't get too close to God. That's what he desperately wants. Another word for sin in the Old Testament is iniquity. Iniquity is the bent of our being towards what's wrong. It's what we are more than what we do. Iniquity is our fallen nature. And what we are by nature traps us in hopelessness and condemnation. That's exactly how the psalmist felt. He felt trapped. And so if salvation is to come, it must come from God. That's why we cry out in prayer. And when we do, even the deepest depths of sin are no barrier to prayer. Though I'm a sinner, I can call out to the Lord with my own voice. Why? because I'm seeking him, his mercy, his grace. 
And that's what the psalmist remembered, and that's why he prayed. You'll have noticed that the last word of verse 1 is Lord, spelt in capital letters, and the Hebrew word there is Yahweh. The second word in verse 2 is also Lord, but only the first letter is a capital, and the Hebrew word there is Adonai, and the same pairing occurs in verses 3, 5, and 6. Yahweh is the name for the God who redeems his people. Adonai is the name for the God who's sovereign. And in linking these two names, the psalmist is saying that in his sovereignty, God decides to save. And that because he's sovereign, once God has set himself to save, nothing, nothing at all can stand in his way. So the children are right when they sing the song, our God is a great big God. He is. But with you, there is forgiveness. Thank God for the first part of verse 4. The psalmist has been honest about his sinfulness and now he's clear about the reality of his forgiveness. Forgiveness is a colossal reality. Forgiveness is a word that drips with blood, for sin merits death. That's why under the old covenant, a lamb's blood was shed. As we remember on Friday, under the new covenant, the blood of the good Friday lamb of God was shed. So we can look to him, we can look to his sacrificial death, repent of our sin, and know his forgiveness and friendship. And that's huge. You see, this psalm has real pastoral value. A Christian does something they're ashamed of. They feel dreadful. They've blown it. What they did was wrong. And as they wince, the accuser gloats. What's needed is the friend who will point the Christian back to the Lord. They don't want to be told things aren't really as bad as they know they are. What they need is the friend who will hear them out and then quietly but clearly say, I know, but with the Lord, there's forgiveness. You see, the good friend takes them to Psalm 130, shares the desperation of verses 1 to 3 and the wonderful, graceful solution of verse 4. With you, there is forgiveness. If the Lord weren't holy, our sin wouldn't matter. But he is. He hates sin and is ceaselessly angered by it. But wonderfully, God is perfect love as well as perfect holiness. Psalm 130 speaks for the whole Bible when it points out that God's forgiveness is real and genuine. It satisfies his divine nature and it meets our human need. The psalmist knows that if God kept a record of our sins and added them up, neither he nor anyone else could stand. But with you, he immediately adds, there's forgiveness. It was this offer of forgiveness by grace, this offer of forgiveness without works of penance that led Martin Luther to describe Psalm 130, the Apostle Paul's type of psalm. There's verse four of this psalm that spoke to John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, when he was so weighed down by his sin. You see, this psalm has the most beautiful balance. Verse three sounds a warning to the presumptuous. And verse four brings assurance to the despairing. And far from encouraging further sin, verse 4 tells us that true forgiveness inspires an awe that leads us to shun sin. It stimulates the type of reverent fear that leads to a heartfelt desire to serve the Lord. And so the bigness of what God has done sinks in. The psalmist knows he didn't deserve forgiveness, but he also knows that's exactly what he's received. And his response is reverent service. 
that doesn't come out in the version uh, that you have. Are you on ESV? NIV. Oh, in that case, uh, you must have the 1984 version. So this is the, the, the later one. But it's just slightly clearer in the later version. The bigness of what God has done sinks in. You see, forgiven Christians take discipleship seriously because we know that Yahweh, the Lord, is the one who redeems his people. And forgiven Christians take the service of Adonai seriously because we know the Lord is sovereign. And the psalmist moves on, moves on from being overwhelmed by his sin to the real joy of reverent service. The fear of having to stand before God is replaced by one of huge gratitude for his gracious forgiveness. Verses 5 and 6. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. The writer's desire isn't just to escape punishment. He also longs for intimacy with the Lord. In verse 5, we see the ground of the psalmist's faith is God's promise. So in verse 6, his soul waits on the Lord. There are two Hebrew words used here, and they both mean the same thing, waiting with confident expectation. Now, you know that waiting isn't always easy. Of course it's not. But this waiting in hope that the psalmist is talking about here is nourished by truths the Lord has revealed, by promises he's made. And his word here means God's word of promise, that promise to redeem and forgive. Our God provides us with his hopeful word, which tells us that he's able and willing to forgive sin, that he loves us with an unfailing love, that salvation is all of him. And so the psalmist is forgiven and redeemed. There's a breakthrough. That's why the second half of the psalm is so joyful. The psalmist had been weighed down. Now he's excited. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. This is the excitement on the eve of something really special. Tomorrow is my birthday. I can't wait. Tomorrow we go on holiday. I can't wait. The long, dark night of this world with its weary history will eventually be over. Things won't always be as they are. Things feel temporary now. One day they'll be permanent. Jesus will return and the banquet will begin. And we need to live expecting that great day. In his word, I put my hope. The psalmist knows God, so knows his word is true. Biblical hope is rooted in Jesus and in what he's done for us. It's rooted in his return. It's rooted in God's trustworthiness. We can't say that we trust God if we don't trust his word and his promises. Verses 7 and 8. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. With the Lord, there's unfailing love and full redemption. So let's return to him, says the psalmist and receive his forgiveness. For he himself, for God, will redeem Israel from all their sins. Shout it from the rooftops. God forgives sin. This is the truth our friends and family need to hear. The psalmist has experienced this, and a bit like that leader in the pensioner's protest at the beginning, he uses his megaphone of a psalm to let the Lord's people know Verses 7 and 8 tell us that God loves us with an unfailing love. He redeems us fully 
and he forgives all of our sins. That's why the psalmist confidently tells the Lord's people to put their hope in him. He's experienced the Lord's forgiveness himself. He's remembered and he knows that with the Lord there's unfailing love, full redemption, full forgiveness. So Israel and Martin and each of us here this evening, put your hope in him. Our redemption and forgiveness are rooted in that Good Friday cross when the blood of the Lamb of God dealt with my sin and yours. This is a truth we need to turn to again and again and remind one another of regularly. And now liberated from his self, liberated from his fear of the depths, the psalmist turns to his people and holds out the certain hope that with the Lord is unfailing love. The Hebrew word is hesed, and that's a big Bible word. It expresses the Lord's ever unchangeable love. Love that is love indeed. Love as only God's love can be. With him is full redemption. For he himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Redemption is the most wonderful word. It refers to the Lord's abundant capacity to ransom his people from iniquity and its consequences. For there's a ransom price that satisfies the Lord's holiness and releases his unfailing love to flow out to the guilty soul. The psalmist is convinced of his own forgiveness. He affirms that with the Lord his unfailing love, despite his people's sin. Like the psalmist, God's people can know the Lord's forgiveness. They can know the Lord's unfailing love. They can know the Lord's redemption. And so can we. And that's what the psalmist sings. Our God is willing to forgive and able to redeem. So this psalm anticipates Good Friday's cross. It's hope, it's helpful preparation for that 10 o'clock service on Good Friday. Because you see, there's nowhere else to go and there's no other than the Lord Jesus to turn to. And what God has done for us, he can do for others. Our experience of forgiveness equips us to urge others, and especially those who are of the Lord's people, to return to him trusting him for forgiveness and redemption. The psalmist's eye is fixed on the God of our salvation, the Lord of all grace. And when the psalmist says in verse 8, he himself, he means only. Only the Lord can save, for only he undertakes the whole task of our salvation. We need to remind ourselves regularly that we've received God's mercy and forgiveness. The psalmist's reverent service is there for all to see as he tells others the good news. Friends, says the psalmist, I've discovered and I know the Lord's unfailing love and full redemption. Life's journey isn't always easy. So this evening, as we take our bearings, what do we need this psalm to remind us about? Is it the unfailing love bit? Is it the redemption bit? Is it the forgiveness bit? Is it the bit about God's holiness? Which bit do you need this psalm to remind you about? You see, the psalmist's song and the psalmist's testimony is that what the Lord did for him, the Lord will do for you and for me.